everybody, and welcome back to My Zero Carb Life. I'm thrilled today to have with me Dr. Robert Sivis. Hi, doctor. How are you doing? Hi. Great to see you, Kelly. Thanks for having me on. I'm thrilled. So what I want to talk to you about, I have done total carnivore. Now, it'll be 11 years in October. And I want to first of all hear what you do with your patients. And then I would like for you to talk to me as a longtime carnivore, because we have a lot of total carnivores that watch this channel, to talk about what are the actual tests that they should care about. You know, we hear so much about what we shouldn't care about, right? Like, don't stress out about the total cholesterol or the LDL as much. I want to know what should I be concerned about. So first of all, tell everybody a little bit about yourself, please. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I'm a surgeon. I'm actually a, a surgeon who backed into this. Um, I'm a pediatric surgeon. My background is operating on babies. Um, I'm also a board-certified general surgeon, but what I found is that more and more over the last 30 years, we've been seeing obese children, obese kids, and we were operating on them for their gallbladders, for their polycystic ovarian syndrome, for a variety of what I call endpoint diseases, and we weren't able to deal with the originating problem. Um, in those days, we thought it was their obesity caused these problems. Now we know that obesity doesn't do anything bad to people. Well, in reality, two things. Number one, obesity will hurt your hips, knees, ankles, and your weight-bearing joints. And number two is most uh, heavy people don't look so good in a thong. Other than that, obesity doesn't harm you in any way. And I've topped out at 300 pounds in my own life. No. So <clears throat> we really... 20, 30, between 20 and 25 years ago, we worked that backwards. If obesity isn't the problem, what is the problem? We recognized that the problem was sugar and starch. It wasn't food. It was exclusively sugar and starch. And in those days, everyone was focused on obesity. Everybody was focused on, on calories. And everybody believed that, number one, carbohydrates were vitally necessary for human survival. And number two is that the evil was saturated fat. Yeah. And... Very early on, I realized that's not possible because how can you be morbidly obese if you don't eat a lot of saturated fat? How can we blame something that you're not doing for your obesity? It doesn't make sense. Yeah. And I knew in my own life, my problem wasn't fat. My problem was sugar. And I had an out of control relationship with sugar and starch. And um, once I topped out at close to 300, I realized that I've got to do something about this. So I looked into surgery. And I said, okay, hold, hold the horses there. We're going to have surgery, but I first want to try to see if I can address not another diet, because I'm an expert at failing diets. I, I'm an expert at failing weight loss programs. Yeah. I've beaten them all. And, um, and I've lost weight on them all, but I've beaten them all. So I said, okay, let me look at this, not from a weight perspective. Why do I eat that crap? What, is, what do carbohydrates do for me? Why am I willing to ignore an extra 100 pounds in order to eat and drink. And why, what's the pattern? And I realized I was eating and drinking, not like my dog, but like a smoker smokes. My dog eats twice a day, but I was snacking here and there, oblivious yes. to it. And by the end of the day, I'd had like 20 mini meals. Yes. And a little M&Ms, a little Coke, a little this, a little that, it accumulates. So I realized that the problem was snacking and also that what I was snacking on wasn't steak and broccoli. It was sugar and starch. Yeah. And I realized that I was eating not for the nutritional value, but for how it helped me to cope with all of my emotional needs. And I shifted in my own life to look at this from a substance abuse perspective, that I'm basically eating and drinking like a smoker smokes or like an alcoholic drinks. And I have to use addiction methodology to help myself because diets are highly deprivational. Yeah. They take her, they kill your best friend and they don't replace her with anybody. The second thing is diets require you to tightly control a relationship you don't have control over. To ask an alcoholic to control their drinking is madness. Yeah. Because by definition, an alcoholic has lost their capacity to control their relationship with alcohol. Exactly the same way. I've lost my capacity and never will have the capacity to control my relationship with sugar and starch. So if I looked at myself at, at close to 300 pounds, completely addicted to sugar and starch, and nobody understood it 21 years ago, and I said to myself, okay, the right way to do this is to remove them from my environment so that when I desperately want some M&Ms, I don't have easy access to them. Okay. Because, you know, if a smoker is trying to quit smoking and they've got cigarettes in their top pocket, they're going to smoke. 
Yeah. But if they crumple up the cigarettes, throw them away and say, okay, this is a smoke-free zone, it's more difficult to re-smoke. And I did that with carbohydrates and it worked. And then I looked at the people that were seeing me from an obesity perspective, from a surgical perspective, from a diabetes perspective, and I realized they all have the same problem as me. One of the biggest frustrations for me is where, where all the keto evangelists love to tell us what we should eat. If you were going to talk to a friend of yours that was an alcoholic, what is the one piece of advice that you would give them? Stop drinking alcohol. Stop drinking alcohol. Exactly right. And, and you know what? What they do drink doesn't matter that much. Are there better and worse things to drink? Absolutely. But right. ultimately, it's about not drinking alcohol and then finding a replacement for alcohol. But what I found in my life, when I gave up carbohydrates, every Tom, Dick, and Harry, every, every evangelist out there was telling me what I have to eat. You have all these, oh, you've got to take this supplement. You've got to take this thing. You've got to take that thing. You've got to eat this. You've got to be vegetarian. You've got to eat meat. You've got to eat. It doesn't matter what you eat as long as you're still eating carbohydrates. Right. When you've stopped eating carbohydrates, then you can figure out and a friend of mine, Ken Berry, I love this word, is the proper human diet. What I found is I have, as a matter of convenience, eating meat and having meat in my house was just easier. Okay. So my migration toward a carnivore diet was a default option because it was easier, it's more comfortable, cost me less, I wasn't throwing food out. And I found my dog is not a big lettuce fan, but he will eat a leftover steak. So, you know, so it was a default option. And as part of that default, I found, hey, this is pretty tolerable. When I'm, in, when, I, when I'm eating carnivore, I don't really feel as much under pressure to eat carbohydrates. Right. It makes my life easy. I work 12, 14 hours a day on a typical day. So when I come home, um, I want to eat leftovers or I want to throw a steak in a, in a skillet or throw some liver in there. Um, throw an egg in there. I want food quickly and it doesn't matter about baking or anything else. And I want to eat leftovers and I want to have a fridge full of food that I can keep there for weeks, not have to throw out vegetables at the end of the week. Yeah. Um, but the concern for me was, is there an adequate spectrum of nutrition? Am I going to lose out on my micros, my vitamins, my trace elements, if I only eat carnivore? And as a physician, as a scientist, uh, and I've got a PhD, so I kind of got two hats on me. Um, I was concerned that I wasn't going to get adequate, adequate nutrition. So if I eat eggs from time to time, if I eat liver from time to time, I'm pretty good. And if I eat fat and protein, which I know are vital macros, um, carbohydrates are not. And if I, eat fats, uh, if I eat meat straight from the animal, not what we do in the US here is we cut all the fat off. Um, then I'm getting in everything that human beings have evolved with. Okay. And I felt comfortable that that was going to provide me enough nutrition. But then another buddy of mine, um, you probably don't know this guy. His name is Sean Baker. I'm kidding. Who? <laughs> um, Sean, I call Sean the experiment. Okay. Because Sean was the first guy out there that put, him, that put himself out there as a doctor. And he said, look, I've been doing carnival for a long time. I'm fine. In fact, I'm better than fine. I'm better than I've ever been. Yeah. So he was the experiment that proved that carnivore is safe and effective long term. Because the first thing you want to do as a doctor is mitigate risk. You don't want risk. Right. And then you want benefit. You know, you can have all the benefit of the world. If it kills you, it's not so good. <laughs> so we are risk averse and then we look for benefit. And Sean was the experiment and I found it was easier. So that's where my migration to carnivore went. Do you still see patients in person? Or are you still practicing? Every day. Every day. Every day. I mean, I saw 14 people today. I'm still a surgeon. I still operate a fair amount, although less now under COVID. And I still see patients in the office. And we treat obesity. We treat diabetes. We treat... Actually, we don't. We treat carbohydrate addiction that caused obesity, carbohydrate addiction that caused type 2 diabetes, carbohydrate addiction that makes type 1 diabetic sick. In other words, it's a type, type 2 component that type 1s get. When they become resistant to the insulin they're injecting, that's the problem. Not type. Type 1 disease isn't a problem other than you have to give yourself insulin. It doesn't okay. cause harm. Okay. It's when you become resistant to the insulin you're injecting because you're eating carbohydrates, that's the problem. You know, the, the big poofa debate right now, do you worry too much about eating chicken and pork or is it just part of your carnivore diet? Every single food that comes from nature has a mixture of monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, and saturated fat. Okay. There are no food sources other than maybe olive oil or coconut oil 
which are purely one source of fat. Right. So when you eat a steak, when you eat a fish, when you eat a chicken, when you eat pork, even when, and this is the bizarre thing, even when you eat vegetables, you're getting all three types of fat in. So to blame one type of fat over another that comes from nature is crazy. However, the uh, uh, hydrogenated fats, the, the, the trans fats, yeah. that when we heat products up and we extract that fat, fat as industrial fat, that is not natural. That does cause damage. And, and those are all polyunsaturated fats, but they're unnatural fats. But 3-omega fatty acid is a polyunsaturated fat. It's got lots of double bonds in it. And that is an essential fat. We have to eat it, out which we will get sick and die. So that's absolute garbage that eating pork or chicken is bad for you. What is bad for you okay. is to eat the chicken breast without the skin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay? Agreed. If you're gonna eat if you're gonna eat the meat, eat the fat with the meat. Yes. Okay. I'll sit down and, and eat an entire rotisserie chicken. Absolutely. And that's the best chicken to eat. And if you yeah. eat the, the, the liver and, and some of the other things as well, you're getting a complete meal. The polyunsaturated fatty acids that are problematic are isolated polyunsaturated fatty acids that come from the manufacturing sector, not from nature. Absolute garbage. Absolute garbage. That's so definitely good. how it feels to me. It felt... Yeah. That idea just feels bizarre. I feel very good eating chicken and pork and beef, no matter what that critter ate. That critter produced excellent meat for me to eat. Correct. And Find that. Here, let's talk about the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is LDL. Yes. Okay. LDL is 100%. And I, I don't use that word in healthcare. 100% doesn't exist that often. Okay. LDL is 100% irrelevant in healthcare. Okay? okay, and yet everybody is obsessed about LDL yes. because we have this whole statin lobby that has grown out of misinformation and told us it's a problem. It is part of essential human function. So LDL is irrelevant. The most important marker of damage in the modern era is actually triglycerides because when you eat a lot of sugar, the way the body defends itself against the damage from sugar is to very quickly turn sugar into fat. And the fact it's transported not in LDL, because it's short chains, it gets transported in triglycerides. So if your triglyceride count is high, it's a marker of chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption. It's a marker of damage. Fixing your LDL doesn't help. So statins are not only of no value to people like you and me on a carnivore diet, they actually potentially make us feel worse. Okay. I tried out a new doctor because my amazing doctor that first put me on this a very low carb keto carnivore diet retired. So, okay. so I tried out a new one and I went and had blood work done before she would take me on as a patient. And she saw that my LDL was 149 and she flipped and of course mentioned a statin. Now my triglycerides were 42. And my HDL is in the 60s, 65. Okay. And I said, but my HDL is even higher than my triglycerides. And she looked me dead in the face and said, that's not really the ratio we look at. And I can tell you, 21 years ago, the thing that prompted me was my doctor put me on a statin. And I felt so awful that I said, this can't be right. And I said, okay, there's got to be a different way. And that's triggered me to go down this pathway. So testing your lipids is really, to my mind, irrelevant. Lipids, your lipid profile just tells me how much sugar you've been eating. Yeah. But the best measure of damage to your body in the modern era is your insulin, your C-peptide, your A1C, and your, blood, and your fasting blood glucose. Those four numbers tell us about damage that people do to themselves nutritionally. Does that make sense? Yes. So if someone goes to get their insulin tested, as I did this morning, and clearly I don't know yet, but I'm going to put it in this video. So okay. you guys see And my it. prediction is, let me make this prediction because you don't know what it is. Do it. My prediction is you're going to be below six on your insulin. Okay. Okay, your A1C is probably going to be anywhere from 4.9 to 5.2, maybe even lower than that, but probably not above 5.2. And if you did a side, it would probably be one or lower. 
And that's called insulin sensitivity. Okay. And that is the marker of health. And under those conditions, your triglycerides will be low and your LDL will be high. If your, tri your LDL, and your LDL has probably been high as long as you've been carnivore. Okay. By virtue of the fact that you eat fat, as soon as you start to eat fat, your LDL will go up. That, it has to yeah. do that because that's the only way you handle fat. Okay? Yeah. So the next issue is this, is that if your LDL is that high and all the other expert doctors are correct and I'm wrong, the damage they're talking about is that tar filling the potholes in the road, and we measure that as atheros atherosclerotic plaque in your blood vessels. Okay. And the commonest blood vessels where that gets deposited is in your heart blood vessels. Yes. So you do something called a coronary artery calcium score, and it tells you how much tar there is in your blood vessels, how much lipid has been deposited. So if it is true that LDL is really bad for you and your LDL has been elevated for a long time because you're on this awful, terrible carnivore diet, then right. your CAC score has to be high uh -huh. because that's the measure of cardiovascular risk. If your CAC score is zero or close to zero, and I don't know what yours is, but, but you're going to tell me in a second, but if your CAC score is zero and your LDL level is high, it is not possible for LDL to be causing vascular disease. That's just Logic, you don't have to be a doctor to say that. I would predict, um, I'm going to go out on a limb, you're actually not a limb, this is stuff that I know, My, your, your CAC score is going to be zero. It was zero. <laughs> I got it back already. So here's right, how, okay. and people okay. have been asking me, how do you get that test? Well, this is what I had to do here in North Carolina. I had to call my, I called the hospital where they do the scan. It's a CT scan. It took about five minutes. I breathed in two times while they took a couple pictures. I even got to keep my clothes on easier than a first date with a breeze. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> Speak for yourself on that one. <laughs> yeah. So after it was over, the woman called me almost immediately because she said she actually knew who I was. She said, I read it right away because I knew that you were dying to know the results. And right. Good. Said, there was nothing, absolute total zero on that. Now, I did have to get my doctor to actually send the request to the hospital. And the way I did that, it, this is the doctor that thought I needed the statin, right? So I called my doctor's office. I said, hey, so doctor hmm, says that I may need a statin, but I would like to see physical proof of whether or not I need that. And so could she please order a CAC scan? And she said, I'll, I'll talk to her. This was the receptionist. They she may not even known what it was. The receptionist called me back and said, it's been placed and scheduled for next Wednesday. Perfect. And that was it. It Perfect. was so easy. So let me get, so they typically, most insurance companies won't pay for them. Some of them do. Okay. Um, but they cost between 150 and $300, probably some are even less than $100. Anywhere that they do a fast CT scan will do yeah. it. In my practice, if anybody's interested in getting a CAC score, in order for me to write a script, you have to sign on as a patient. So I'll take you on as a patient and I'd be happy to write that script for you. Um, you may have to pay out of pocket, you may have to get it. But that for me is the holy grail because it's looking directly at the damage. Yes. And here's the problem. If everybody had a CAC score, okay, and yes. let's assume LDL causes the problem, mm -hmm. then why not only treat the people with awful CAC scores? Right. Okay. That, but that's you what are I living. Know. Why right. not? Why is everyone right. not having this done? Because they're making assumptions that your heart is bad because your LDL is up. Now, it is true. It is true that typical people with elevated LDL on the standard American diet. Uh, will have bad CAC scores, okay. but in 100% of those people, their triglycerides are high. Yeah. So if your triglycerides are high and your LDL is high, you can expect to get plaque, not because of LDL, okay. but because of the crap that you're eating. You're either smoking or eating sugar or both, okay? okay? But if your triglycerides are low and your LDL is high and your CAC score is zero like you are, yeah. You've got no problem. There's no damage. And they just cannot wrap their heads around the fact that what they've told people for 30 years, that fat's bad for you, could possibly not be true. I left there with my little zero CAC score. And at first I felt happy. Almost immediately I felt angry. 
because I thought even my own dad is on a statin and he feels horrible. He's been on it for years and he, he doesn't feel good. And no one ever even asked him to take that. He has never I asked him. I said, did anybody ever ask you if you wanted a CAC? He said, I've never heard of it. Should I get one? And I wanted to ask you, why wouldn't you get one before you take a statin? Should people? Because doctors, two, two reasons. Number one, doctors don't know what to do with them. Okay. Number two is the CAC score proves them wrong. <sighs> yeah. And now they're in this conundrum. Okay, well, the her, her LDL is high. I have to prescribe a statin, but a CAC score is zero. If I don't know about the CAC score, then I can just come to this prescribe the statin. Oh, that's it's maddening. So it is so challenging to us in healthcare. But, but I'll tell you two things. Number one, I love writing scripts for CAC scores. And you know what? If your CAC score is positive, okay. it's because of carbohydrates or because of nicotine, quit smoking, quit your carbohydrates, yeah. and eventually your CAC score will radically get better. Okay. But if your CAC score is up, is elevated, yeah. your risk of a heart attack or a stroke because of smoking and because of carbohydrates is high, don't take a statin, get rid of the drug. Yes. Does that make sense? So whether your CAC score is high or not, it is motivation to do the right thing. For you, it's a matter of pride that you are doing the right thing. But yeah. for them, it's, oh God, I was trying to ignore the fact that I was fat and sick. <laughs> CAC score says I'm, it's awful, it's 1700 or whatever it is. I've got to change my way of life. So it's motivation to do the right thing, but it's not motivation to take a drug. Another test I want to ask you about that we hear about yes. quite a bit, but I'm curious if you think, is the C-reactive protein, high sensitive CRP, that's right. valuable? CRP talks about inflammation. It's a yeah. global marker of inflammation. And I don't actually use CRP in my environment. Okay. I use other markers of inflammation because CRP is very volatile. It goes up and yeah. down all the time. It really doesn't, in isolation, give us a lot of information. Okay. If I'm eating all meat, or at least really close to it, and my you know, all markers for my inflammation stopped. I used to get boils repeatedly. They just stopped. So I really didn't need a CRP test to tell me that I wasn't inflamed anymore. My body yeah. was letting me know. I, I right. used to be on prescription acne medicine and I was able to come off of that. My cycle became regular and painless even. There are so many things about our health that I think our own body tells us that we don't need to see on a test. But if right. you've got a doctor who is upset and wanting you to take a statin, then a CAC test and looking at those low triglycerides, that's what you're wanting to see, right? right. And um, insulin test, I'm going to pick a look. No doctors or very, very few doctors ever test insulin and C-peptide because they don't understand. Even endocrinologists treating diabetes don't look at that. And uh -huh. you really can't effectively diagnose diabetes without doing that. A large number of patients that come into my office with a diagnosis of type two, end up having autoimmune diabetes or type one, and they don't even know it. Huh. So I, I just a little, little important piece of information. Yeah. I, I saw two people today that came in, they're solidly carnivore, and I know it's true, and they've been carnivore for a year or two, okay. and they can't get their blood sugars down, and they've been told they have type two diabetes, and they're very frustrated because they're not eating carbohydrates, and their two is getting worse rather than better. Huh. And I did something simple. I checked the insulin, I checked their C-peptide, and I checked the A1C and their blood sugar. They don't have type 2 diabetes, they're 1s. Oh. They have type 1 diabetes. And they get misdiagnosed all the time because they don't test those numbers. So whether it, it is you're worried about your lipids or whether you're worried about your diabetogenic criteria, check your insulin, check your C-peptide, check those numbers. Those are the most valuable numbers for me. You were and, the only reason I had that check today. I have a stack of blood work that I've kept throughout all my years of carnivore. I went through it page by page looking to see if anyone had ever checked those two numbers. Never. Right. Never. And the flip side of it is this. If your C, if your C peptide or your insulin is elevated, you're consuming sugar. Okay. Or your liver is producing sugar like crazy. Okay. Because you, you will not have a high C, C peptide if you are not in glucosis. So those for me are the most important bits of blood work. The hormonal stuff, that kind of thing, I look at that to tell a story and more as a tracking thing. The other important thing about blood work is blood work is not something that you do once. 
You do it as a sequence as people change to see improvements. Um, I look probably at about uh, 20 or 30 blood work panels per day. Wow. So I've looked at tens of thousands of blood work and pattern recognition is what we look for. So, you know, coming back to the CRP, I've found over years, we used to do it a lot. We used to do HOMA a lot, HOMA, uh, IR, but the, the value, the predictive value, the disease value is just not there for me. I've got okay. other things that have much greater value um, that tell the same story. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. This summer I had a sunburn at the time, a really bad peeling sunburn. Mm. when I had my CRP checked and it was prior to that, it had been 0.5 and it was up to 0.7. And I'm pretty sure it was just something that minor. It, Any inflammation will cause that to bump up. Okay. You know, inflammation is the body's protection against things that happen to it. The uh -huh. inflammatory response is a response to things that irritate the body, whether it's a toxic drug, whether it's a bacteria, whether it's a cancer cell, whatever that may be, but inflammation should come and go. Okay. When inflammation is persistent, when your inflammatory pathway is persistently activated, that's when bad things happen, okay? So you get a sunburn, it's gone in a few days. Yeah. You have a blip and it goes away. You get a cold, you have a blip, it goes away. No big deal, okay? Right. But if it's there persistently, that's problematic. And the goal there is to, to keep your inflammatory system, to keep those soldiers ready to go but not active. And when you talk about COVID, which is the big thing now, yeah. the people that suffer are the people whose inflammatory system is already so busy taking care of what they're doing to themselves that it really can't effectively respond to COVID. So if you're not eating carbohydrates and you're not smoking, you're far more likely to have a trivial course with COVID than you are if you're eating a lot of carbohydrates and smoking. Not because smoking and carbohydrates are the problem, but they trigger the inflammatory response that's already diverted. You know, if you're fighting a war over here uh -huh. and the enemy comes in over here, you don't have the resources to fight it and it overwhelms you. And that's what happens with COVID. So they talk about COVID in obese people. They talk about COVID in people that have heart attacks in, in people yeah. that have diabetes. No, those are the results of chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption. It's insulin resistance that is the problem. Yeah. So it sounds like whether it's COVID, infertility, heart attack, ADHD. ADHD, okay. Yes. Just boop, cut out the carbs, get yourself a fatty steak, and whatever ails you, you're going to feel better, right? Exactly, exactly right. But you won't feel better if you eat a steak for the first time today. It'll be no. nice, but it takes time. Yeah. And, and understand that you're going to feel crappy at first. Yes. Crappier at first before you get better. Don't give up because you feel worse for a few weeks. That's right. Yeah, because that you've got to go patient. through that. Yeah, your body is not used to this. It's like if you've never exercised, you haven't exercised for months, and you go out for a run, the next two days you're going to feel stiff. Yeah. But if you keep running, you're going to feel so much better on the back end of that. Right. And it's the same principle. It's coming off carbohydrates will make you feel terrible. It's withdrawal. Like any smoker, like any alcoholic, they go through withdrawal physiologically and psychologically but on the back end, you're a lot better. The carnivore diet doesn't make people better. The carnivore diet is normal. You've just eaten a bunch of crap that made you sick. Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah. And really what's happening is you're getting rid of harm and toxicity from your body. You're not getting better. And the problem with so many people say, oh, you've got to take this thing to make you better. No, I want to be as normal as God and my genes made me. Uh -huh. And if I remove things that make me less than normal, the default option is to be normal. Yeah. Does that make sense? So yeah. carnivore doesn't make you better. It's getting rid of all the crap that makes you sick. Yeah, I feel like now I am the woman that I was meant to be when I was 25, except that at age 25, I was covered in boils and acne and infertile, and I was 260 pounds. Right, and now, psychologically miserable. Yes, but now I feel like I am the normal that I am meant to be, that I should have been then. Exactly right. Exactly right. So, you know, I, I understand your, exuberance, uh, your exuberance and how high you are on this, but that's called normal. That's how people yeah. should be. Yeah. You shouldn't be sick and you shouldn't complain about every little thing. Right. And, uh, you know, that's, people don't understand that. They say, okay, well, if the, if the standard American diet is normal, then carnival makes me better. Then carnival makes me, no. The standard American diet is a diet of illness. Yep. It brought you down in the first place. Exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. 
So be normal by eating food that the body is designed to eat. I think the key thing that we've got to understand is we have to have confidence in what we do. You're confident that carnivore diet is good for you. Yes. And you keep doing that and you've got the measurables to show that it is. Yeah. Okay. I'm just confident that the information I share with people is true. Yeah. Because I've got to have those convictions to be able to talk about this. Dr. Savis, I cannot thank you enough. You are changing the world. And I am so grateful that you see patients daily in person and on the internet. And if someone does want to contact you, what's the best way to do that? So a couple of things. I think just from a knowledge perspective and spreading the word um, on YouTube at Carb Addiction Doc, okay. um, we put out videos every week couple of weeks there's a lot of content on there that fleshes out a lot of what we talked about yeah. um, i'm on instagram at carb addiction doc i'm on you i'm on facebook at robert Sivis md phd and if you want a consultation um text us to 561-517-0642 perfect i will link to all of that right down below i have very much enjoyed talking to you and i always enjoy your videos so thank you and i hope to meet with you and talk to you again in the future I love that. And just one final comment for you. Yes. Looking at you, we are looking at success. Thanks. And that's such an important thing. Thanks. You know, when you look in the mirror, you see success. And yes. it's because of the hard work you put in that has now become a lifestyle. And that's what I want for every one of my patients. Yeah. So it goes to you. You're doing a great job. Thank you. It's exactly why I have I talk to people like you is I feel so good. I want this for everybody. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thanks. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.